Poltergeist is a 1982 supernatural horror film that was directed by Toby Hooper, who, of course, first gained a little bit of notoriety in the horror world with the original uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre installment. And then, of course, went on to create this beloved classic as well. But before we jump into that, I want everybody to say hello to a very special guest. I want to say thank you for joining us, Mr. Jen Fedotov. Did I did I say that correctly? All right. <laughs> All right, Mr. Jen Fedota from uh, Get Me More and from AB Films. Um, honored to have him here as my guest. He has been a very, very awesome supporter of the channel, and I can't thank him enough for that. So uh, welcome, Jen. I know we just talked a little bit, but you want to share a little bit about how you are and just just before we jump into the into the poltergeist discussion? Absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me. I am a huge fan of what you do and how you do it. I admire the structure, the discussions you have. And so it's an honor for me to be here. So thank you so much. I'm doing great. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, trying to get into the film world and I try to do everything I can. As an actor, I don't get the job all the time, but I try to get on set and help around. So I've been on a movie set for the last two weeks, working 13, 14 hour days, driving an hour there, one hour back. And I'm trying to catch up on sleep. As you can see, <laughs> the bags are in my eyes. It's not from watching Poltergeist, which I did. Uh, but it's from trying to catch up on sleep. Which is another reason I can't thank you enough for joining me because I know that your schedule has just been like wicked, wicked busy. So I totally, I can't, I can't say thank you enough. Well, um, before I dive into like where I would have started, I want to ask you, because honestly, Poltergeist, and I'm a little ashamed to admit this, <laughs> as much of a supernatural and horror buff as I was for a long time growing up and throughout uh, my high school years and everything like that. And I mean, I, buff was the word. If it, if it involved any sort of horror, especially supernatural horror, I was, I was all over it. And then I don't know what happened, I guess, after I became a dad, uh, you know, somewhere around 2007. It's not necessarily it, it's just there wasn't that many movies that caught my interest. I tried digging that, you know, checking out Paranormal Activity and it, it was OK. Like I watched the first I got through the first three. And then when I saw that they were doing one past the, the third one, I was kind of like, are we are we still doing this? OK. And that's where it kind of lost me. Now, that being said, I was a little more closed off to it. So I'd be open to checking it out eventually to finish up the series uh, as I've kind of gotten into the stage of my life where it's like, ah, you know what, go back and check it all out because you don't know until you've actually sat down and watched it. Yes. Um, but so I, I, I just recently saw this movie for the very first time, uh, probably about three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Oh my so, god! Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a, like I said, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that that's the case, but uh, it is what it is. And I gotta say, like, I, I, I couldn't. There are some movies where it's like, yeah, okay, I finally got around to seeing it, and it's just like I'm not hard on myself over it. It's just like I, I got to see it when I got to see it. I was kicking my own ass uh, when I realized what I had missed out on all this year because this was just, it, it was everything that someone like me looks for the majority of time in horror movies, which is you look for things that touch on everything from, yes, you want spooky. Yes, you want scary. Yes, you want that. But you also want, you want a little bit of heart and, and laughter and a little bit of character and a little bit of that in certain instances. And another good example of a movie that ties the kind of lighthearted, more comedic and fun elements together with, uh, with horror and a little more on the nose example, of course, is like Ghostbusters. And for me, there was a lot of things about this movie, although it little pulled definitely more towards the horror in this regard, that reminded me a lot of the fun and energy that comes along when watching like Ghostbusters. And especially there was a like a similarity in the type of effects used, the type of, of course, it was the 80s, the type of lighting used, cinematography used. And I was just amazed by how it all pulled together so well for this film to create such a fun time as well as a like, wow, that was pretty spooky. Like it was effectively spooky. Um, so, but what was your experience with it, man? Like when was the first time that you sat down and watched the poltergeist and like, what were your thoughts on it? Wow. I think the first time I watched it was in Mexico and I was very little. I moved from the Ukraine and I lived in Mexico for 10 years. So I watched it in Spanish. 
So I was just, as you were talking about it, I was reminding myself on a couple of notes I wanted to touch on. And I honestly feel that people would have more of a connection with Poltergeist if it was better advertised that Steven Spielberg produced it. And the rumor is he directed quite a few of the scenes. So when I watched it, I honestly had a feeling that I was watching some weird version of E.T., but horrorized because it had those elements of child connects with something outer worldly and there's an interesting family dynamic happening and nobody is really paying attention to the child but stuff is really happening until you know the parents notice the furniture is moving yeah. uh the little the older brother is having a very bad time with his toys and stuff outside of the house anyway so my impression was uh, very significant, and I didn't know that that kind of film existed. Before, I just used to watch kung fu movies and action movies, which I loved, but horror wasn't my jam at all. Oh, wow, okay. But Poltergeist actually changed my mind on what horror films could be, and I think the reason why it worked for me as a kid is because it wasn't as scary. And, and that's exactly what I guess I was touching upon. It's great to have those horror movies, especially as adults, where it's like, man, that's just scared the ever loving crap out of me. And I took it so seriously. And I and I, you know, I like I really felt the fear and all that kind of stuff. That's that's awesome, too. That's awesome. To, but I guess what I was touching upon is like I usually have more fun and that's the point of these movies i have more fun with something like with like this and and you're right it is because i mean it's rated pg there's nothing too you know too bad about it although if it were released by today's standards it would definitely get a pg-13 rating by with nothing else with a few of those scenes but um <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I can see that even though I didn't see it as a kid, like I said, I felt a lot of ghost and I watched a lot of Ghostbusters as a kid. So I can definitely connect with that. It was more, wow, this is just like, ooh, and ah, and whoa, than it is like, oh my gosh, like I've, I'm going to have nightmares for the rest of my life and I need to, you know, see a therapist and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's not the same thing as like a 10 year old watching Nightmare on Elm Street, which I can personally relate to. <laughs> the funny thing about nightmares that you mentioned, and this is where it comes to not being that scary. I was a kid when I watched Alien mm -hmm. and I had night terrors from Alien for at least a week with Poltergeist. I had none of that. It was entertaining, but as an adult, I learned to explore the behind the scenes of movies because I feel they are sometimes just as interesting as a movie. And Poltergeist has a lot of very interesting supernatural elements in not the film world, but behind the scenes. And I, I, I haven't dug a whole lot into that yet. Just very little scratched the surface of, like, as I was kind of researching a little bit, just like in preparation for this conversation. And I'm like, um, and I mean, like, after I watched the movie, of course, I was planning on taking notes and stuff like that and doing some type of video on it anyways to, to include with this, uh, with this Supernatural September series. And I was like, wow, I, it, yeah, it kind of freaked me out to see, like, all the various reports from people on set and that were just tied in and connected with the movie and so many unexplainable things happening like as a result of what they say and then in hindsight was probably some like unethical means of obtaining some of the get stuff that they used for the film i guess is, is sort of how it goes <laughs> are you talking about the skeletons yeah, I, I, I mean. <laughs> so the, can we go into smaller spoilers? Absolutely. Like, and in fact, that's why I was looking forward to doing a conversation with somebody. I want everybody to be fully aware we are going to go into spoilers here because this is meant to be a more like in-depth conversation about why each of us love this movie. So fair warning, there will be a good amount of spoilers ahead. But yes, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, so. At the very end of the movie, and actually one of my favorite parts, where the family discovers why their entire house and neighborhood is being haunted. It's because they developed this new housing complex on top of a cemetery. They just removed the headstones, but left the bodies. So 
one of the members of the families ends up in a pit full of water and they're trying to get out and the skeletons start floating up and they are very well done and i remember reading a reddit uh, ama by the actress performing the scene and she says well these are so amazingly realistic and what happened is instead of creating molds and props of skeletons they use cheap skeletons which as you mentioned somewhat weirdly unethically obtained materials but they they use actual corpses obviously with some mods and to be honest as a filmmaker that amazes me that that passed by steven spielberg and he, he said yeah let's do that oh, all right let's let's save a few yeah, hundred bucks <laughs> let's use real corpses but also it brings the level of this is actually very creepy as an actor i wouldn't jump in a pool full of corpses i not for any million dollars okay uh twist my arm maybe for a million dollars but anyway <laughs> <laughs> it was an amazing scene and it worked so well and there are elements in the movie that are definitely jarring and creepy that um, were for sure super dangerous I mean um, there was a scene where the little boy is being choked by a clown myth and confirmation from the main actor is the stunt went wrong the little clown was actually, actually choking the child and Spielberg pulled him out of that prop. So there is that. Um, but the, the fact that it used practical effects, which is one of my favorite mediums for portraying outdoor worldly things, still makes this movie today very awesome and believable, even though it has corny elements that make it look like a combination of a horror and comedy, which works so well for this film. Uh, yeah, I, I I absolutely agree. And it's funny that you actually mentioned like uh, some of those scenes, especially because I've, I've got written down as some of the notes, like some of my like like some of the scenes that just made me go, oh, my God, that was that was great. Like because of like, oh, the practical effects, kind of knowing a little bit more of the uh, the authenticity behind some of those effects <laughs> helps to explain the uh, the authentic feel that they created because I've definitely got this when the, yeah when when the mom is in the in when they're in the the area where they're digging up to build the pool and yeah and she's in there and all the skeletons start rising up and uh, the kids of course that portal to the other dimensions open and the kids are you know they're 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 hanging on for their life and and they get to that vertigo shot when the mom enters the hallway right before they get to that little final sequence there which is like it, it sets the tone so well for it and um man i it just it, i miss I, I know and i know like most people that aspire to be filmmakers like you know like ourselves it's like they you are always i think we're all in agreement especially those of us that grew up in that period of time it's like you just you miss those practically applied effects so much even when there was nothing necessarily fancy about them they to me were almost a little bit more and, and, it, and it goes in combination i think and i won't go on too much of a rant here but i think it goes in combination with it's a good and bad thing, sort of, to the degree of which technology is constantly evolving to the point to where it feels like it's constantly got to be utilized for, you know, cinematic storytelling. Sometimes it's very effective and it's and it works really, really well. I'm not saying that, you know, there isn't room for impressive motion cinematography and cool little, I mean, if there's any new movie that, you know, really makes good use of that and from my personal opinion, I know a lot of people are split on it is, you know, is uh, malignant, which James Wan is just great about that kind of stuff about knowing how to utilize motion cinematography. But when I go back and I watch movies like this, and, and I think that's also a part of the reason where they're like, well, these effects won't work if the camera's moving because we the, the perspective's not static. It won't be believable. So we have to create a 3D element to help move with the camera and make sure that it looks more viable and believable. So I do get that. But there's honestly, like when I go back and I was watching all these movies and from the 80s and the 90s and the 70s even and, and the 60s, and it's like, I kind of miss the simplified take on cinematography when it comes to 
the storytelling, the more stripped down approach, mainly because it was just as effective back then, if not more so sometimes, because sometimes, whereas the motion can be helpful in expressing what's going on, can also be a little distracting and serve more as a gimmick than here we're watching the story unfold and we're getting sucked in and drawn into the story. Um, sorry, I didn't, once again, didn't mean to go off on a, on a whole like rant like that, but that's a, one of the many, many aspects that I love about this movie because right from the opening scene when they end the American National Anthem and they cut to the living room and the TV's flickering and the lights are going crazy and the little girl just walks up to the TV and it's all just shot in such a way that, and of course, Jerry Goldsmith's score behind it is just a very, very helpful accompanying factor in all of it. But it just right away sets this like, oh, man, this is a, unnerving and a little creepy and a little like, where is it going from here? And then, of course, it takes you from that scene to the opening credits where it's this nice, happy, you know, establishing shot of this beautiful suburban neighborhood and everything like that. And again, accompanied very nicely by a much different uh score <laughs> um, a different side of the score being done by jerry goldsmith and throughout the entire movie those elements just pull together so well to to keep you engaged to keep you drawn into this world the thing is from the filmmaker's side i understand the hesitation to use practical effects yeah um, it's not because there aren't artists that are doing it well and convincingly it is mostly because of the practicality of shooting the scene and having to reset the practical effect simply takes a very long time yeah it's time consuming and sometimes you actually can't some props can only be used once uh, i remember reading about the thing and one of the practical effects could be used once and then to reset it it would take an entire day so for filmmakers to have only one take on anything is really not pragmatic. But going back to Poltergeist specifically, I feel that it really uses the formula very well of establishing a real life situation, something that the audience can relate, family, kids, suburban, somewhere. And it introduces slowly but surely elements that confirm that there's something else that is not explainable. So that's the first chunk of the movie. The second chunk of the movie is we need to find an explanation for it. And you and I have seen it in the Conjuring movies, which we love so much. It's somebody tries to come in and explain what is happening and give a particular you know, script to the lore and how things will be working from now on to explain this is why this happened and I can help. Little do they know, Everybody was wrong anyway, because the supernatural is still supernatural, and you can understand a tiny bit of it, but science and mind explanations and the supernatural are useless. And the third act <laughs> cements all of that by saying, well, guess what? This is what's happening, and you have no control over it. Right. And the only thing you can do is run away. It's like, you thought you, thought you got it under control, but... <laughs> and, and all of the supernatural films that I feel do it well have that element of tricking the audience into f getting into the shoes of what's happening, then trying to figure this puzzle because they were giving some information that it's actually not completely accurate, and then being on the thrill ride of, okay, I'm going to run away. And because they connected to the audience at the beginning, that rush at the end is very real. You really yes. want to get out of that situation because you understand, you lost understanding and control at a certain point, and it's natural to humans to want to escape from what they don't understand. So the movie does it extremely well, and it sells it by very good and outstanding performances by actors you don't actually see often on screen, and especially, I think Spielberg has this, Nick for picking up child actors that are amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he did here. He produced it. I'm sure he had a big hand in the casting of the child cast. And my God, the cast altogether is great, but the girl who is interacting with this insane supernatural world sells it. Yep. And you know, I have a little niece 
She just turned five, by the way. And anybody who has interacted with a child has seen certain elements of, who are you talking to over there? And, oh, imaginary friend. This is oh, Susie. Yeah. Or, this is Lyle, whatever. But then you watch films like this and you're like, okay, how many things I'm ignoring from what the child is telling me? That's yeah, actually- right. Like, you're brushing it off. Like you said, no big deal. <laughs> right? So the fact that this movie brings that little element and actually says, oh, wait, uh, it's all happening. It's all real. And you, adult, should have been paying more attention. I love that. It's just so good. Well, and to touch to touch upon more, like more of like what you were saying on a, on a couple of different fronts there, because um, first of all, the, the, what you said about making the audience kind of like pulling that rug under you, like, oh, you think you've gotten it. You think you understand, but wait a minute. And then it, that, that sets up for the third act. And that really reminds me of The Ring um, when y- you think, you know, oh, well, she's she figured out what's up with Samara. She figured out the story. She got the body from the well. So she helped her. Everything's good. And then she gets home to her son. Everything's relaxing. She told him, yeah, we have. And he's like, you helped her. And then it's like, oh, shit, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> so, yeah, that, it, you're absolutely right. The best of horror movies will lull you into a false sense of security before really sliding you into, OK, here's what you don't know. Here's what you do know. And here it is. But now we're going to reveal still all of this unexplained, unexpected stuff uh, and and save it for you and throw it all at you here in the third and final act. And in this movie in particular, the other thing that you were, that I want to touch upon is like how you were talking about the the performances and the the way, and also too, I love the way that the characters and, and, and they're not, I feel like a lot of writers could sit down and watch a little more movies like this and, and really learn to take cute, subtle cues. Cause it's little things when it comes to just making sure that characters have those little quirks that make them viable and believable because every single one of these characters seems like somebody, you know, in real life, and they just seem like your you know, friendly neighbor. And the other thing is each one of these characters, my wife would argue there's one that she the, the little boy annoys her with all of his with all of his scares and whining now personally me i found all of the characters to be you know in their own way very entertaining and engaging and what i love about this movie and of course most especially the little girl because like you said she i mean from the get-go she's the one who really establishes where the focal point of the movie needs to be who the focal character is and she she does she sells it so well from the first line on, I mean, right when she's putting her hands on the TV. What I all, what I love about how this movie does with the characters and the performances is that you're already in love with this family because they're all cool in their own way. The mom, once they figure out and they start seeing like the chairs moving, but she's kind of into it at first. She's like, isn't this kind of like cool? And like kind of, and the dad's sort of like, huh, what's, what's going on here? And, and I love that dynamic. So you're already in love with this. And then, like you said, they bring in that element of somebody that can provide exposition and a little more knowledge into the background. So they bring that first character and team in to help, to try to help them out. And then at that point, you're like, wow, this, cause they're, they're slowly, but surely are introducing more and more characters that are adding significant value both to the story and to the entertainment value of the movie. Because that first lady that they bring in, when she steps into the house and she sees it and in her reaction, like she's just like, you know, and then the entire movie gets stolen when they introduce the latest character, when Zelda Rubenstein shows up and just steals the whole freaking movie, like, like that in two the delivery of two lines because she's just so engaging and so over the top and but it's so good like it fits the tone and the and the feel of the scene and my favorite line i've heard is she, yeah gonna you better tell her she's gonna get a spanking if she doesn't come <laughs> from hiding so I, I i got a blast out of literally every single character uh that they had to throw at me in this so you're absolutely and- right but the thing is, and a lot of movies try to do it today to follow that formula, and we are all familiar with this formula, even though we might not be fully aware of it, we know what to expect from the film. The interesting thing is I didn't feel distracted by it, and my mind wasn't trying to figure out, 
okay, now they're going to do this. Okay, now they're going to do that. And I, even from the filmmaker's perspective, I always try to dissect it. No, in this film, I actually just sat down and was so engaged with everything. I think um, what happened there is for the, and, and why there's a difference between the little girl and her slightly older brother is that the older brother's suspension of disbelief and his imagination is no longer so innocent. He understands right. toys shouldn't move on their own. There shouldn't be weird sounds that you can hear but cannot see. You shouldn't see people on the other side of the TV and another dimension. For the girl, this is still something that is normal. It doesn't spook her as much as the little boy. So that's another selling point for me where I was totally into the story because I know kids, I know when there is that switch of, you know, I believe in this or, or I don't anymore. Oh, yeah. When they start <laughs> growing up just a tiny bit. And as you mentioned, the characters are so relatable. And I mean, you really fall in love with the family very quickly. So to be honest, and rumors at times confirm, even though Spielberg denies it, I honestly feel Spielberg had a big role in at least providing very serious direction to the director who it totally doesn't feel like it's the same director that did the Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So that's the beauty of Poltergeist. Could be a hidden Spielberg horror film and look at what they've done in later movies with Spielberg. Think of War of the Worlds where he tries to do that family dynamic and you immediately see, oh, right, that is the style. You can see it's the same person aligning those little dots to make the family more relatable, more believable with their troubles, but also you identify. It's just so good. I see, and I haven't actually seen War of the I've never, I actually haven't seen that one yet. So I'll have to check that out to see, to get an example of what it is that you're, what you're talking about and how Spielberg sets it up. I can definitely relate it to as you brought up earlier et and how they kind of how they set it up that way i guess what i meant and it's not to pick it writers i guess it's just to say look at this as a great example of some people try to overwrite dialogue to give characters personality and my thing is you don't have to if you if you just focus on unique dialect and delivery and point of view from each character and lay it in gently and subtly sometimes i think that's more effective than overselling with basically what's what comes across to a lot of people a lot of times as over expository dialogue you know and that's kind of the, the the criticism that you see especially from filmmakers that are doing movie reviews and everything like that that they always that i always hear time and time again which is show me don't spend a whole lot of time telling me you know yes it's difficult though I, it is it, and i and i because i and i totally re agree and relate to both sides as a consumer but also as somebody that that knows the other side of it too it's like you said and it's like you said with the practical effects working with you actually being on set and having to deal with these things and you are you're dealing with schedule you're dealing with money you're dealing with insurance you're dealing with things there's all these real world reasons why practically practical effects don't get used anymore all that much i mean and and, it, and it's true it's a sad fact but it's true i was merely i guess harping on the fact that nostalgically a lot of us still look back at those films and go man but then again it's all about money it saves time that's the whole thing about it is that it saves time while shooting sometimes the producers will have a heavy hand in actually deciding what goes on screen and I'll give you an example of the remake of one of my favorite movies with the best practical effects to date, which is The Thing. Yes, yes, absolutely. And when they remade The Thing, which I loved, by the way, they were, all of the creature effects were practical. They did everything impractical. And then the oh. producers decided that the audience is not going to buy it. And they redid all of that on top of the practical with digital effects. Ah, uh, okay. Because the idea is practical effects are outdated. Let's not use them, even though they have decided they're in production. And I know the production company and I know the special effects uh, artists. I've seen so many different podcasts and 
this kind of conversations with them, the effects were legit, very beautifully done, and they worked fantastically. So sometimes it's really not even up to the filmmakers, but eventually after the fact, and the that, producers will decide, let's do the VFX instead. And that's absolutely true. And I'm not going to, I don't want to step in too much of a pile here, but there's, there's definitely one big studio out there nowadays who makes a, they, they, they kind of make it a point to make sure that they, 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 they show audiences that, Hey, we know best. You don't know anything. Now sit back and shut up and enjoy our content. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the classics are still classics. Today, there is more horror movies released than any other kind. But we, those who enjoy horror movies a lot, especially supernatural movies, still reminisce of stuff that I didn't even watch when it was released. I was too young. I wasn't even born. But stuff like, yeah, I no, don't know, I mean, The yeah. Exorcist, Phantasm. Phantasm, um, yes, man. What a great out there flick. Right? And I'm not even sure if Phantasm is science fiction or supernatural at this point i know um, I, it's, right? it's an on the fence one really yes the omen there's something about the films being shot on actual film with the grain with the different color scheme that are not so bright you will see that in poltergeist there is no sharp colors everything is actually more classic of a look i'm gonna say Very and desaturated. there's something of that particular look that makes those films feel special and you're way more forgiving because you're so more engaged that you're not looking at the small details to pick them apart. When I look at modern horror, and film, horror films and especially supernatural films, I have more of a critical eye because I can say, well, you could have fixed this in, a, in post and done those things. That wasn't much of a possibility back then. And, and that's a, that's a fair point. Absolutely. Right. And Ghostbusters, for example, they are very janky, very not good effects. They still work but for we me. But forgive them. <laughs> they still work for me. <laughs> the monster that, you know, the gargoyle that becomes this supernatural demon dog. Yeah. I honestly feel it, the composition and the color and the lighting when it's interacting with the real world is completely off. But I still forgive it yeah, because you forgive it, right? No, I and I see what you mean. But I guess that's I'm I'm like that when going into a movie, anyways, because my brain knows this is this is all imagination, and I think that's where a lot of people. Uh, and I'm not criticizing audiences, but I think that it is a good thing to remind both consumers, filmmakers, everybody across the board that that's where the love of film for all of us, when you're a kid, especially, starts. Is it's all about taking you on and away you know on your imagination so there's a lot of and i do agree it's like yes i want to be able to be sold to the point to where i don't have to use my imagination so hard to believe it but i still feel like man if i'm not willing to go into a movie with a little bit of imagination what the f am i doing here <laughs> so l l let's jump into poltergeist what is your favorite part of the movie and why <laughs> oh man Gosh, it's like I said, the, the the my very favorite part actually that sticks out right to my mind, and you touched upon this earlier, was when it the big reveal comes um, as to why everything's happening, and Craig T. Nelson's just standing there, just screaming at the top of his lungs to his boss. You just moved the head. You just moved the headstones. You didn't move the body. He's like, he's just losing his ever loving crap with this guy. And it's, and it's absolutely amazing. It's an amazing moment. You can tell at that moment, like he's being directed so hard. It's like, don't try to think about this as you trying to look cool on camera. You're not trying to this, you're not on camera. Like, Think about how angry you would actually be if somebody put your family in harm's way and there would be no cool about it. You'd be a, you'd be a ranting, raving madman whose voice pitches in falsetto. And it's great. Like I absolutely, it just, it fits with the scene just well. Now, as far as that's probably that moment that you're going to get a spanking line delivery. Those are probably my favorite moments performance wise uh, in the movie. As far as effects wise and practical effects, I, I, you know, I really have to say the scene where 
the little girl is simultaneously getting sucked into the closet and the little boy is getting eaten by the damn tree. Like, there's just something about that scene when I saw all of that going down. Like, obviously, if it was happening in real life, and I mean, it would just be absolutely terrifying. But the way that, again, the cinematography, the lighting, the music all pulled together for the, and the effects all pulled together for those scenes, it created such a morph like fun kind of atmosphere even though these horrible things were happening like i'm sitting there watching it and i'm going but i've got this like huge smile on my face because like it's like oh my god like this is so absurd but like how awesome <laughs> like how awesome like to have an imagination once again to come up with like wow so this is how we say this other world is trying to get to our kids. Like, and like, it's not in like, it, it is in no subtle way at all. In fact, that's what I love about this movie is that there's aside from the writing and the dialogue and the characteristics of the characters, there's nothing subtle about the presentation of the movie itself. <laughs> who is your favorite performance? Like in the movie, like who does it for you? Who really outside? And I know the little girl is the one who, draws it all together so i guess i'll veer away from aside from that main character like what other character in the movie just like you were like man this really did it for me like this is what this is this was the character that to me just brought me the most amount of joy or that delivered the best scene or that delivered the best dialogue aside from caroline to be honest her mom is up there for me because yeah. i mean put yourself in those shoes of I can't do anything to rescue my child. And then she is the one that has to go into the other dimension and rescue her and that kind of stuff. It's a memorable scene. And not only for me, there have been homages to that scene. I remember watching Color Out of Space with Nicolas Cage, which is a cosmic horror film that stands out in my mind as spectacular. And it was very overlooked. There's a scene where the mom is trying to rescue the kid I'm not going to talk about Color of Space, but it, it is a direct homage to this. Okay. And that very instinctual connection between mother and daughter or mother and child altogether is something that I very value in this movie. It's done very well. The level of worry that the parents go through, it's insane. But that particular uh, scene and performance to me is really what makes this film so believable, so relatable, and it's very emotional. I mean, you, at a certain point, as you mentioned, are watching it with a grin because this is very entertaining, but you also feel the worry of the parents, especially of the mom, because she really is willing to do anything, literally go into another dimension through a door to try to grab her child and bring her back. That level of commitment of the actress and you know the pool scene with the corpses also stands out <laughs> it's just amazing and i think yeah that's my favorite performance altogether because that scene is bonkers things are happening you have to make a choice between which child you say first and it's just yeah. you know it insanity is happening and, and they did it very well they made chaos very understandable and that's not and that's not an easy feat. And then like and like you said, too, to because you did, whereas you and that, I guess that's what I keep alluding to. And I draw to how well this film balances the, the genuine spookiness with the fun, because, yeah, while you are, you're entertained and you're having a good time. You are simultaneously drawn in because you care about these characters so much that you do and you feel their worry. And you're right. Joe jo Beth Williams's performance in this movie is absolutely fantastic like there, there is nothing like her performance in that final scene when like i said like that especially when that when they set it up right for that final act when she's standing in the hallway and she sees that red glowing light around the frame of the door and it does that vertigo shot and you're like yes here it goes it's like here and like man she just she just goes in and saves the day like a champ, man. And it's it, it was just a, such a well-written character, such a strong performance. And like you said, such a memorable moment. And it's just like this on top of all of those other ones that we mentioned are definitely why it's like I, I kick myself for saying, man, I can't believe that I, 
I waited all this time to see what obviously has earned its place as a very celebrated and revered horror classic in the eyes of of fans i mean just everywhere and and i can totally get behind that now because it's like oh yeah and i not only do i see it it's like gosh this is one movie that i can honestly say i wish i had grown up knowing about this movie because it would have been one of my favorites absolutely one of my favorites wait a little bit and rewatch it there is classics that i rewatch almost every year not only because they're entertaining but there's something new i catch on every time i watch it yeah, me too. Even Jaws, I that's one of my I yearly watch Jaws and that hallway shot you're talking about, you can clearly see how much Spielberg had to say in that particular yeah, shot. That's, that's so true. Right? Yeah. Now so, that you say that, you say Jaws, and now I'm seeing that scene simultaneously. Yeah. Okay. And it's that effect to really distort whoa, what? Yeah. Anyway, Poltergeist deserves a rewatch around the Halloween era where you're looking for something to share, maybe with your family, maybe with your friends, maybe on your own when you do have a quiet moment at night. It's worth watching with the lights off, not during the daytime, so you don't have highway distractions and other sounds like have a bus passing by right by the house. (laughs) So that's what I did last night because I was fresh in the movie. I know what's happening. I've seen it probably a good dozen times, but I just wanted to have the feeling and the experience again, just to be refreshed and the way it made me feel. And it still holds up to today as thoroughly enjoyable, relatable, so much scary where it needs to, but not too much. The way it's made really makes me smile. And each time I watch it, there are little nuances I catch here and there. So if the audience hasn't, you know, seen it yet, and I hope they're wondering, what is this all about? It's worth your time and definitely, definitely worth sharing with your friends that haven't seen it because it's one of those horror classics that inspired so many of the horror movies we enjoy today. And yeah. you can directly see they stole from this scene, from this character that's in a match to that and that. It's so good. Also, after watching and going on this supernatural horror binge, just slightly off that way, because I, I grew up in one movie that like that I loved growing up was, a you know, spoof on horror movies. I loved both of the first two scary movies and uh the second one of course is a big jab at you know the first one of course it picks on slasher horror but the second one dives all into supernatural horror and i gotta say not only with poltergeist but i had also like i had just seen a few other movies uh for the very first time rosemary's baby is another one that i had that i actually just saw for the very first time like not yeah. long ago and uh but anyways like so all these different things that i like now like thinking back to scary movie too i'm sitting there going oh and the haunting is another one uh the original i loved the remake was it was okay um but i can definitely see after watching those and the poltergeist and all this like all of those all of those scenes where they're directly setting up spoofs for the, those movies make a lot more sense to me i think the only one i was like super familiar with at that point i mean i knew what they were making fun of i knew that they were making fun of the haunting mainly and of course i had seen the exorcist that's probably my favorite like still to this day it's like that's one of the scariest movies i've ever seen but It's like, I definitely got where a lot of the jokes were coming from, but after being able to see uh, this movie with all the other classics, it's like, oh man, I need to go back and watch that movie again now and see how much better the the humor lands knowing the actual scenes from the actual movies. But I absolutely have to um, echo what was just said by Jen. If any of the audience is watching and you haven't yet seen this movie, don't do what I did. Don't wait to go check it out. It's uh, actually streaming on HBO Max. If you have a subscription, go over there and go check it out and uh, do it before. Do it sometime within this holiday season, this Halloween season, because it's the perfect atmosphere to get yourself nice and spooked out, but yet have a, a freaking awesomely fun time. So, Jen, I really, really want to thank you once again for uh A, being patient with me because I know I ramble a lot. (laughs) And uh, B, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much for joining me on the channel. And uh, 
man, just have an amazing week. And uh, everybody be sure to go and check out Jen's channel, Get Me More, where he talks about all the movies that he checks out and uh, shares a love and passion for. It's it's awesome. I love his uh, his enthusiasm and I love his passion for the way that he describes exactly each of the elements that he finds appreciation for with these films. So definitely go and give his channel a watch. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching today's video. I hope that everybody out there is doing well. Be sure to hit that like button if you enjoyed it. And don't forget to subscribe so we can see you all in the next video. <laughs> thank you for having me. Have an awesome day, guys. Today's video has been brought to you by the Three DOS Ghosts Gaming and Entertainment Organization. Please click down on the link below to check out and join our community discord.